Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity discussion panel, Smarter Data. If you like today's discussion, you can meet all of the experts speaking today at our upcoming Smart Data Conference and Expo, August 18th and through the 20th in San Jose, California. Just go to smartdataweek.com to check it out. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we do encourage you to do so. Just click on the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our moderator for today, Dataversity's own CEO, Tony Shaw. Tony is, of course, responsible for the business strategy of the company and its subsidiaries, all of which conduct educational conferences, training, and publishing activities focused on the area of enterprise data management. And with that, I will turn it over to Tony to introduce today's panelists and to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon, and uh, welcome everybody today, including our panelists as well as those in the audience. Um, uh, today we're going to talk about smart data. As you know, uh, I, I don't think any uh, irony or sarcasm was intended when Shannon was playing the tune Smoke Gets In Your Eyes prior to the, the call today. Uh, um, but certainly, you know, I think there's, there's um, a little confusion perhaps around what this topic really means and uh, and what smarter data can do for you. So uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our panelists uh, today who are going to try and provide some, some clarity through that haze. Uh, the first panelist is Dave McComb. Uh, Dave is a longtime colleague. I'm pleased to say uh, he and I worked for many years together on the Semantic Technology Conference. Dave was a co-founder of that particular uh, very well regarded event with me. Dave's a uh, longtime consultant. He was also the author of a text called Semantics and Business Systems from um, Morgan Kaufman and uh, uh, it remains, I think, a really excellent introduction to the subject of semantic technology in a business environment. It's a, it's a um, it's a well-written text. Sean Martin is the Chief Technology Officer and a founder of Cambridge Semantics. Cambridge Semantics is one of the leading vendors in the smart data field. Prior to Cambridge, uh, Sean spent 15 years with IBM Corporation where he was a founder uh, and visionary for the IBM Advanced Internet Technology Group. So Sean's been in the uh, area of internet technology for the past couple of decades. And uh, Dave Dugal, I'm also pleased to introduce, is the founder of a, a very innovative startup called Enterprise Web, which offers an award-winning application platform for dynamic, data-driven, and elastically scalable business processes. Uh, among its other uh, awards and, and uh, honors, uh, uh, Enterprise Web won two coveted SIAA Cody Awards this year for Best Semantic Application and Best uh, GRC Application. So, uh, gentlemen, welcome, welcome all. And uh, uh, why don't we start out by talking about our own perception or our own definitions of what is smart data? So, Dave, uh, please kick us off. Okay, sure. Great. I guess. I guess, oh, which Dave did you want to go? This is going oh, to be pardon bad. me. I've got two Daves, don't I? Dave McCone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Um, so, yeah, I like to think of smart data, put it in context with just where are smarts in general in a system. And in a traditional system, the smarts, and by that I mean the uh, what things mean, the constraints, the rules, the usage patterns, all that kind of stuff, are all pretty much in the application code. You know, they were in the modeler's heads, they were in the requirement analyst's heads, they moved into the developers, some of it's stuck in the documentation, but most of it's really just in the code. So we got all this smart in the code, and people have been knocking, you know, existing applications and the legacy systems because they're not flexible, 
And it's not that the existing databases aren't flexible, it's this arrangement of putting the smarts into the code, I think, that, that make them inflexible. So then NoSQL came along and big data, and what we have done is taken the smarts out of the application code and put it in the heads of the data scientists, which may or may not be a step forward. It seems like that, that might actually be a step backward. Um, what we really want to do, my take on, on smart data is what we want to do is take the smarts, the meaning, the constraints, the rules, the usage patterns out of the application code, out of the heads of the data scientists and put it in the model where it belongs, where it's available to everyone. Okay. Uh, Sean Martin, why don't you tackle this question? Uh, f uh, thanks, Tony. So um, I'm obviously not going to disagree with any of that. I, I, I think Dave has uh, the sense of it right. But for me, there's a very formal definition for smart data, and that's really the both uh, at, the, at the model level, we use a, a, a standard called OWL for the web ontology language, and uh, at the instance level, we use a, a standard called RDF, which represents sort of individual facts. Um, and then there's a, another standard called Sparkle, which we use to uh, query the combination of those. What's very powerful about these r relatively simple standards is, um, is that they're standards and that everybody can share them. So as we start to enable software stacks like we, we've done at Cambridge Semantics, we have something called SDP, Smart Data Platform. We embrace the meaning and models that drive every single aspect of a system. And what it means is that somebody can come along <clears throat> and produce either a model or, or instance data that our system can, without having any prior knowledge of that information, slurp it in and do, make, do something sensible with it because we've, we've got standards. So, uh, so for me, the, the semantic web standards from the W3C are, are the core of smart data. We're now starting to see domain groups like uh, CDISC uh, in, the, uh, in the clinical trial data space and FIBO in the financial industry business uh, ontology space, that's the EDM Council and the AMG, they're starting to embrace OWL as a way of expressing their specific domains. And, and what's so nice about that is, is that software that respects the underlying standards like OWL can simply import those models and use them directly, and suddenly your software is, is much smarter. Uh, from a sort of philosophical point of view, I think what we're starting to do, and this kind of echoes Dave, but we're starting to arrange data for the benefit of, um, of how humans want to interact with it as, as opposed to the efficiency of processing. So we've suddenly got enough um, horsepower in terms of cheap RAM, uh, very cheap random access in the form of SSDs, very fast interconnect, very fast multi-core CPUs. There's a lot of extra power there that we didn't have before. And so we can add this level of indirection, this level of semantics or smart data. And for the first time, um, it's, it's much easier to write systems or build systems that are, are arranged for the benefit of the end user. And, and smart data is the core of that. Uh, being able to do things declaratively um, is very important and, and much, much more flexible and easier and easier to maintain and cheaper and faster. So, so that's the core of smart data for me. Okay. Sean, just before we, we move on here, uh, your line was coming out a couple of times there, so um, if that situation continues, uh, we may need to have you call in again. But um, okay. just uh, me last, last half of your statement is, uh, uh, is fine, so we'll just keep going with the timing. All right, Dave DeGal, uh, what's your version of what smart data is, please? Okay. Uh, batting third, I'm, I'm uh, d uh, disposed to actually say uh, that, of course, the other two uh, made some very um, good points, Dave and Sean, uh, that I'll agree with. I, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll tend towards uh, Dave McCombs' more generalized uh, description. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would actually call data smart. I mean, if in the whole DIKW, you know, data information knowledge wisdom stack, I think, you know, data is information without co its a context. Uh, so I, I'm not sure data is con uh, is smart. I think data with its relationships to concepts and activity, um, which I think uh, matches up or aligns with the constraints and the usage patterns that Dave McComb described, that's what's smart, right? So then exposing those relationships to you know constraints and use management patterns so that they can be understood by humans and systems, putting information uh, data in its context, that's when it becomes powerful. And I think actually when that's done in a fully 
automated fashion, I think that's really critical because I think there are, I'm not sure if I completely agree that there's only one way to describe smart data. And I think there is, um, you know, we would describe ourselves as a standard-based platform. Uh, we use all the modern technology standards, and Semantic Web is, and using RDF now, uh, Sparkle is one set of standards that you can apply for making information. It's, uh, and we could read and write uh, RDF triples. Uh, but I think that also when we're looking at fully automated systems, and I think that's the end goal, right, is that these relationships could be fluid, that we don't have to have rigid hierarchical master data management models anymore, which I think we'd all agree with. Uh, but we also don't want to actually create, I don't necessarily see of static triples either. We really want a system that can actually, re, a system of models that can be reacting um, to each other, that we can have machine learning and adaptation, uh, that we can do this in very fast real-time systems so that we're bridging the gap, not, not just talking about data, but actually bridging the gap between data and applications, um, uh, which, you know, I think is, is the, you know, the other side of this coin, right? If we just talk about data in isolation, we're really only talking about one half. Um, you know, we're really talking about smart, if we're really talking about smarts, then we're really talking about systems and applications and their relationships to data. Okay. Well, that foundation, move on just a moment. I see a couple of questions already, and I do want to invite everybody to send your questions as we go through. Uh, we're, we're going to continue with our first couple of uh, panel questions first uh, before we come back to audience questions to those. So. Uh, but we're usually able to get through everybody's questions by the end of the program. All right. So um, having provided some, uh, some of you here of what smart data is, um, uh, where is it being applied to the uh, actual deployments? Is it, is it just theoretical? Um, how is it useful? And, and uh, so I'll uh, avoid the... Um, well, just, let's just uh, jump in and let Sean tackle this question first. Uh, thank you, Tony. Hope, hopefully you can hear me uh, clearly now. We can, um, yes. So, so um, obviously we have a smart data platform, so pretty much every single engagement we have with a customer is a smart data engagement. Um, at the moment, we're seeing a lot of adoption um, in, in financial services and, and, uh, and pharmaceutical areas. Um, as well as others, but those two have a lot of focus, and it's also partly, I think, driven by some of the standards focus of the domain groups driving that. But if I, if I think about a particular, you know, a recent situation, um, uh, let's see, the, 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 we've had a couple of uh, implementations recently where customers wanted to, uh, pharma customers wanted to pull together uh, end user views of across clinical trials. So embracing both uh, structured data, uh, you know, coming out of out of statistical systems as well as, as uh, document oriented data like uh, maybe um, uh, clinical trial protocol documents. And, and one of the things about smart data is that it, it, it provides a way to, to join both structured and unstructured data. In the end, you get data that is, is represented formally. It's described using models and so on. But, but, but tying the two together, the data where you've, you know, coming from very gray areas like using text analytics uh, along with formal data, which is coming for usually from structured sources, uh, being able to tie those two together, you need a very flexible model that can grow as, as new facts are discovered as, as the model itself expands. So allowing end users to, um, to very easily ingest uh, data or rather have maybe have IT help them ingest the data and then have the end users be able to use the same models that, w that made the ingestion very easy. Um, help them generate queries automatically so that they exploring the data and discovering information without actually having to understand the underlying mechanisms for doing the queries and being able to do that across a much broader set of data um, uh, than, than has been traditionally possible. Uh, current uh, sort of traditional analytics tools tend to lend themselves to fairly narrow analysis and, and the users end, end up asking questions that aren't quite there in the center of the data that's presented to them. So there's a cycle where they've got to go back. Whereas uh, smart data allows you to build much more complex, more rich, broader pictures and in an ad hoc fashion ask questions across that, that broad picture provided the data's there. So, very recent example, clinical trials, uh, being able to load all your clinical trials up across a drug and, and have a look at that in, in one go. That's a very useful current uh, example. Okay. 
Um, I understand there's some problems with my line as well, so I'm going to try to defer as much of the conversation to the panelists as possible. Uh, Dave Dugal, uh, could you please answer the question then? Where are you seeing smart data applied and deployed? Great. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, so, you know, again, we would look from the application side, so the application of real-time data for smarter applications. And so uh, I'll give uh, t outline two, uh, I think, strong use cases that hopefully will be relevant or at least, uh, you know, uh, add some clarification to, uh, to the audience. So uh, one is in telecom. So in telecom, uh, we've been, uh, we just won an award for most innovative solution in an emerging area called network function virtualization, which is the real-time construction of telecom networks and the delivery of network services, firewalls, load balancers, um, uh, you know, uh, voice over IP services like we're using today. Um, the real-time distribution and balancing and lifecycle management of those kind of services um, based on over volatile networks, so you have to you know, be able to analyze the state of the network, um, work across potentially multiple um, what they call administrative domains. So, in other words, a delivering of a delivery of a network, uh, telecom service might actually be managed by multiple partners to deliver that. Uh, the functions themselves might come from multiple partners. So, you might have people delivering a voice over IP service, might uh, people delivering some sort of um, radio access network to deliver to your cell phone. Uh, so, you have all these different functions, and they're actually all subject to different standards. So, there's actually multiple standards involved, multiple technologies involved. Well, all these, so you of these multi-domain uh, distributed computing problems, right? And in this case, what our software is doing is it's actually taking uh, a declarative model uh, of intent. What does this network service supposed to, you know, uh, Tony is a platinum customer for voice over IP. When he makes a request, he has to get uh, these five nines and he's supposed to get, you know, these SLAs met. Uh, instantiate Tony's service over the network and maintain it even though the network is volatile, which might, means scaling that up and down dynamically. So, you know, uh, so that's in a certain intelligence just to manage that in real time. But the other aspect of intelligence here or smart data that comes into play is in that in the domain I just depicted is there's a lot of change, right, between the, the partner, um, the partner um, functions might be up, being updated, the partner's um, networks might be up, being updated as well at the same time, the policies related to a network service might be being updated. Um, so you actually have to build this declarative description of a business a network service that's you know, understandable to a business user, uh, that they can describe it at a very high level declaratively through policies. They can say, I just want these behaviors over these networks in this fashion, and then let the software manage all of the volatility in the background, right? The volatility of the network and the volatility of the, of the integrations between all of the partners. Uh, so uh, that's one, one kind of real-time challenge we're working on. Another one is in life sciences where we also work in uh, supporting some uh, uh, of the world's largest research hospitals and managing um, regulations over all of their administrative processes where we actually calculate rules over uh, researcher activity in real time so the researchers can focus on their actually research studies, the subject of their uh, uh, research, uh, as opposed to trying to manage all of those and try and keep in their mind all of those rules. The system actually, every time the research takes an action or a rule changes, it sort of recomputes the state of that application. And if there are any new uh, requirements, it auto-tabulates that uh, and notifies the appropriate people or triggers the right processes. So two different very different um, scenarios. One is a, a highly regulated, long-running human process, and the other one is, you know, real-time, you know, systems, infrastructure, cloud processes, uh, but fundamentally driven by the same principles of smart data. Okay. So, uh, Dave McCone, I, I left you to the end here because you're, to some extent, the odd man out here. You're the consultant. Uh, you're the um, uh, you're almost the client representative here, um, uh, whereas our other two guests are, uh, have, have products that solve problems in this space. So let's see how your, uh, uh, your response to this question is, is maybe a little different. Where are you uh, seeing smart data applied? It ends up being kind of the same. Um, <laughs> oh. All right. Michael, I are Yeah. 
So we're working with a large electric device manufacturer who has acquired a whole bunch of other companies, and every company they acquire has their own catalog system, their own product management system, et cetera. They're all different. They're all arbitrary. They're all complex. And they ended up writing uh, literally hundreds of these things they call configurators to help electricians put together complex combinations of electrical parts for construction projects, things like that. Just the complexity just went on and on. And we worked with them, took one of these systems as a, as a starting point and created a, a model, like Sean suggested, in OWL that, that abstracted away the structural complexity but retained the a model of, of what these things really meant. Uh, and that, that model ended up being about 2% as complex as, as the model we started with. We started with a model of 700 tables, 7,000 attributes, and ended up with 46 classes and 36 properties. So, so the whole thing, in some ways, this is the Forrest Gump style of smart through simple. You know, just make things simple as you can. Um, and then we were working with another uh, consulting firm who was doing the, the rule writing. They were able to rewrite these configuration rules. Instead of writing them to each individual system and to the arbitrariness of, of the data structures, they could write rules that were about you know, laws of physics and electricity and don't put something with a higher amp amper amper amperage unit uh, downstream from something with a lower one, it'll blow up, you know, that, and then physical constraints and configurations, but not the, the arbitrariness that was, that was baked into all their existing systems. Um, so then, and also like Sean said, we took their existing data, converted it to the standard RDF, put it in triples, put it in a triple store, we could query it with Sparkle, they were then writing the rules against that Sparkle endpoint, um, and then, you know, we got a couple other extra bonuses out of it. We got to the end of it. They decided they'd been having a lot of trouble complying with uh, a standard called ETIM. It's an electrical device standard uh, because they'd been trying to do it at a, at a very detailed level. We were able to just write uh, a, a way to do configuration at the uh, kind of at the abstract property level there, which took you know most of the effort out of it. And then uh, Finally, they had, a, they had a company they acquired. They, they wanted to convert the data into this shared format. Um, did that in just a few weeks, and later, and you know, all the same queries still worked. Everything worked the same, even though they came from radically different systems. And we then found out that they would actually acquired that company ten years ago, and it, you know, for ten years they've been talking about trying to convert this data. And we said, you know, if, if you actually know what it means and know what the rules are pretty straightforward. So I guess I, it, it all sounds great. Um, uh, let me try to, to get the dummies version of this just for a minute though, because uh, on the one hand, the powerful load of the system is, it, it, it sort of just sounds like you're programming, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more, rules into a system and then, um, is is the intelligence in the rules, or in, to, in in what way is the intelligence in or the smartness in the data? Um, uh, Dave McComb, this is really a follow-up question to to your statement. So what what we're doing is mostly trying to avoid writing hundreds of thousands of rules. In, in, in some ways, that is what an application system is. It's a whole lot of very trivial rules about moving data back and forth between screens and databases and stuff. So pretty much, you know, walk away from all that and when you have a, uh, a, a lot of the smarts in, as far as we're concerned is in the economy and the elegance that you can get to when you are no longer burdened by the structure. And then so when you get to a fairly elegant uh, structure, there are rules, but there are, you know, between dozens and hundreds and not thousands and hundreds of thousands. So I, in some ways, the, I, I really do think the smartness is in the simplicity. Okay. Sean or Dave, do you, do you have a different answer to that question? 
Uh, yeah, I, well, actually, I, I would say it is, it, you know, what uh, Dave is saying is actually, it, it might be non-intuitive, but it's, it's absolutely true. I think in IT, we have a lot of accidental complexity, right? We build all these structures in an ad hoc basis. We create all these arbitrary rules, and we create legions of them, and then we wonder why interoperability is a challenge. And I think ultimately what you're looking for, is, and I think the struggle of our age is, given that the world is increasingly dynamic, distributed, and diverse, we, if we just accept those things to be true, then we need architectures to be, you know, to uh, new architectures to serve those requirements so they can adapt more flexibly. And I, I think the key is having a very, uh, what you would call from the platform perspective, very um, uh, uh, streamlined meta model, right? The meta model of the platform itself has to be really streamlined to just say, hey, you know what? It's just just like in um, genetics, right? Uh, GCAT, right? Every every you know, the DNA is is all encoded in four things, right? Uh, G, C, A, and T. And actually, uh, in in chemistry, we're also made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, right? That's Sean. So you know, the the world, uh, all organic things are made out of very simple things, and then they're just combined to create very complex things. I think what in IT we've created very complex, rigid, accidental architecture structures that make, that uh, that force us to have very simple applications. And I think when you have a very simple architecture, when you rethink it and you have a very uh, intentional architecture, the architecture becomes simple and the interactions become very rich or complex because they're allowed to uh, dynamically resolve themselves for a certain context. So I think that's sort of paradoxical, but I think when you build things and the things themselves are very complex, then your interactions are constrained and therefore very simple. When you have a very intentional architecture and you abstract away a lot of things from the business user and just say, hey, just work in this universe where you can, can compose policies and can compose nodes to create business value, the system gives the appearance of being much simpler, and the interactions can be much richer. Okay, so this notion of, of reducing complexity and enlarging simplicity is, is coming through pretty strongly at this point. Sean, uh, any any addition you want to make to these previous yeah, comments? I, I, have, I, I, I totally agree with all, both of both of the Daves, and I, I'd add that that what we're starting to see now is this extreme flexibility. Um, one example that's I think pretty familiar to most people who who do any amount of data integration is is really the, the if, if you think about the the sort of the inherited model, the relational model we've been using for the last thirty odd years. Um, in that model, we've we've conflated schema, storage schema, with meaning schema. And this has caused all sorts of, of difficulties in terms of inflexibility. It really puts us in a spot where when, when we build a data warehouse or do an integration, we have to predetermine exactly what questions we're going to answer, and then we build a data structure uh, which reflects both the storage and the um, and the meaning, the logical meaning of, of the information, and it's all tied up in the same place. And, and then we have a big project where we, we put the data into that. And, and as soon as you want to ask another question, you've got this huge problem where you, if you can't find a way to, to kind of massage what you've got into, into something that can answer that uh, query or that question, then you're going to have to go in and, and change the structures, and it's, it's very expensive to do that. When you are able to abstract your models away and simplify, and I like the way that uh, Dave put this earlier, um, you're, you're really um, you're able to evolve your models uh, much more quickly uh, in the face of, of changing uh, business data requirements, and, uh, and when you you no longer and, and more than that, if you've got models that can express uh, relationships much more easily than say you can in sort of interlinked tables, which is what you have in a relational model, ironically. Uh, if, you, if you've got a modeling language like R where you can express complex relationships, you can get to much, much richer representations of reality. And that, in turn, will drive business value because you can ask much, much better questions. Um, when we start layering in unstructured data with all of its infinite amounts of uh, potential for uh, additional uh, data and uh, entities, uh, and types of entities, uh, it's just things spiral out of control. And so, if you if you're trying to gr grasp this world now, where we, you know, I've read the other day that something like 80% of, of a business's uh, data is is, is text. Uh, if you're starting to bring that into the fold, and nearly all of our customers are, and that's really a, a new thing in the last couple of years, maybe. 
um, and, and join that with all the sort of things that IT have traditionally been doing, the, the, the structured data, uh, and tie those things together to get much richer views that, that can, be, uh, can answer wider and deeper questions, then, then you're really starting to get to value. And I think that's the key uh, here. We, we're, getting, we're starting to use the uh, smarter data to get to value quicker uh, and be able to do more with, 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 with the same amount of resources. Okay. So the first question was asked, I'm going to go to the first, the, uh, the audience opportunity to do that is that uh, historically, and, and this is probably controversial for some folks, but um, uh, reasonable observation is that model-driven architectures have uh, already failed. Uh, the question says they've already failed. I, I guess that's where there might be some controversy. but. Um, and in, in many cases, spectacularly failed uh, if, um, uh, if you believe uh, someone like Scott Ambler, who's, who's a, a strong, uh, agile evangelist. Um, so if, if model-driven architectures have failed in the past, what makes us believe that putting models such as we are into smart data is, is likely to succeed? And I'll let anybody answer that if you wish it. May, may I? This is certainly not. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Sean, if you want to. I was going to say that it's definitely not proven that the model-driven approach is, is failing. It's actually <laughs> totally the opposite. We're, we're seeing extraordinary gains through using models. And we're not talking – there's a question of semantics here because we're not actually talking about the same kinds of models. Um, a model-driven approach in code is very different from a model-driven approach where you're using abstract models uh, that are easy to operationalize, or something like OWL. Um, the other thing that uh, that may have changed drastically is our ability to scale this. So, you know, it may have it may have seemed like we were unable to address the kinds of you know the wide variety of solutions people wanted to address four or five years ago. Things have moved on. The, big, the whole big data thing now uh, has changed the, the, the level of scale at which we can apply um, these abstract uh, semantic models or smart data models, uh, and and that is transformative. So we are using using models at the center of everything we do, and it is actually extraordinarily liberating. And if you don't believe me, uh, please request a demo <laughs> just to see the kind of power we can unleash <laughs> with models, because <laughs> it really is All right. uh, breathtaking. All right. Sean, you I, as, the, as the other vendor on the phone, you might uh, you know expect that I would likewise agree that. Uh, but it's also from the demand side. I would you know we, we participate in many movements uh, from OpenStack. I was just at the Open Daylight Conference. Uh, I mean, uh, to pretty much every major open source movement, and they're all looking to be model driven. And I think the reality is, the complexity of the business environment and the requirements of the business requirements. So, you know, not just some philosophical, abstract, architectural requirement, right? This is not just about, you know, me, Sean, and Dave, uh, you know, really liking these ideas. Uh, I would say these are necessary for the continued survival of, of the organization, right? Because we have to automate, automate our way uh, into the future, right? If we look at it, it's 2015, and we've automated a lot over the last, you know, 100 years. But one thing we haven't automated as of yet is IT. All right, as we have to turn uh, automation onto IT itself so that we can scale our cloud environment, so we can manage complex rule domains, so we can manage interoperability uh, in our new value webs that we have today. So that will all be done by models. They will be done by much more flexible structures um, that uh, can adapt to changes uh, as, as they occur while provide, you know, persisting history and being fully auditable. So I, I think it's true what the, what the person that said as far as you know, prior attempts have, I don't know if they've failed, it, but I think they've been limited. But then again, you could look at uh, you know the high rate of failure in IT in general. It's seventy-five percent of IT projects are indicated to be failures. When you go over a project over a million dollars, it's like ninety percent. So what's the cost of static siloed IT? It's in the trillions. Right, so I think uh, it's the um, you have to look at it. I think you have to look at it relative 
to the alternative or the status quo, and then also look at the new requirements and, and uh, also the new technologies that have been enabled. You know, obviously, with the web, big data, et cetera, we're just we are in a new age. So uh, I, don't, I think the person who wrote that in is is correct. Certainly, there have been challenges in the past, and that's led people to be more tactical and code up siloed solutions. I think now uh, people are looking for more generalized solutions for greater visibility of their and uh, more centralized policy management, uh, and that's going to drive them towards model model based development. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, David, I, Tom, I'm sure you have an answer also, but I, I'm going to ask you to hold up, please. Okay. We've got some, some other important topics to get through here. So uh, I will give you first uh, crack, though, at the next question, which is, um, and we, we started to talk about this a little bit in terms of how the smart data work. But um, so let's say you're a customer who's, who's intrigued by the ideas that uh, they're hearing today and, and are thinking, okay, so how do we get started to do something useful with smart data? What's your advice? Well, kind of the, the stock advice, everybody wants to do a, a proof of concept and then a pilot, et cetera, and, and I probably can't dissuade them, but most of this stuff is already proven. You know, the, the, I, guess, I guess people just desperately have to have internal demonstrations to prove it for themselves, and so I, you know, I don't know that I can radically change that, but everybody has a, a huge backlog of, of gnarly problems they want faced. Uh, a lot of it is is pick one that has some characteristics that will showcase uh, the smart data approach early on. Uh, but but don't, you know, we're we're really trying to counsel clients not to pick this as being yet another application because if you already have a thousand applications and you come up with a clever way to make a thousand and one, um, you haven't really made a lot of progress. I think we want to be uh, using this as a, as a way to get beyond the application-centric mentality. Um, that actually raises a, a point that I was trying to get at with this particular question today, which is, um, uh, you know what's what's the mindset required to get started here? What is what is different about uh, approaching the smart data uh, in terms of how the business needs to think about it? If it's not I, just another application, right? And and I and I suppose where most of our clients are starting with it, and, and Sean was hinting at this as well. It's it's if your intractable problem is the fact that you have data in, in many different systems, and many of them aren't even traditionally structured systems, they're social media and, and semi-structured data and, and completely unstructured data, just textual data, and if that's what is currently frustrating you, uh, then sooner or later you're going to say, you know, the only way to, to bring that all together is to have a model that is not structure specific, structure independent, and can represent the stuff that's in all those different systems and finally bring it all together and, and get something done. So, you know, I think the, I think the, the mindset is, is a combination of frustration plus hope, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I, I, I was really happy with where you were going there until the very end. Um, uh, uh, let's let me let uh, Sean and Dave. Where do, where do you recommend your clients get started in thinking about smart data? You go ahead, Dave. Um, so you know, I, I think it, it won't be completely <laughs> inconsistent with Dave. I think we generally go grow as you go. I think the uh, the challenge is uh, the challenge is people feel like this is new, it's transformation, it's scary, um, their careers are at stake, and, and I think you have to back people off of the ledge. Um, I think you know sometimes it does help to do a proof of concept just to show people that hey, look, I can actually very rapidly build something that actually is fully functional, that demonstrates a capability uh, exactly that you. Might might have struggled with in the 
past. So usually, usually I think two things. One, the whole point of a platform is to provide a unified architecture, uh, common tools, libraries, and services that enable people to start building things on top of a platform and then let you scale them out over time, right? You can scale your operation. So you don't have to, you can always start with a scope of X, I guess is what I'm saying. Is we don't have to burn down the legacy. I think that was generally a bad approach. I think what you're looking to do is uh, tackle a problem that's real and concrete to the organization, identify some initiative or some pain point, uh, and then, hey, then call upon like a technology like Sean has to offer or we have to offer or somebody else has to offer and say, how would you solve this? How would you make my life better and not just maybe solve this problem at the same time? How could I apply the learnings from this or and the technology here to a broader set of problems and expand it over time? And I, I think that's the benefit of the, uh, you know, the new technologies out today is that you can, you know, essentially think big, start small, and then scale based on, uh, success. You don't have to just make one big leap into it, right? It, it, it is some new capabilities, but I think the more that you make, you know, make it this sort of big do or die thing, I think the less likely it's even ever to go off the ground. I think the key is to say, hey, there have got to be problems where your organization struggles with uh, being faster, being smarter, being more adaptive. Let's tackle uh, maybe being more connected and networked. Let's tackle one of those problems, use data in a new kind of way, and then maybe that will be its own proof point to build, you know, um, support inside the organization. Okay, Sean, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to answer this question um, by having me ask it a slightly different way. So you you've acknowledged that uh, your products are based on um, uh, internationally accepted standards, including RDF and and ALF. So. Um, is, is that the starting point for a customer is to learn about those standards and then convert all their data to RDF and then they've then they've got something ready for Cambridge semantics to work with or, or how does that part work so um, in the early day I mean we've been maturing our stack for quite a while uh, but in the early days um, we do, did have to have a fairly technical approach, so you were really trying to persuade the people who could understand um, the semantic approach. Um, but as we've uh, matured and as we've abstracted ourselves away above the standards, so you're no longer kind of day-to-day -day bumping into URIs and you know the low-level nitty-gritty of Sparkle queries and so on, because our software is taking advantage of all the smartness and actually leveraging it, um, users are further and further away. And, and our preferred approach to getting a company started now is just to show them something that they just couldn't do. Um, and it showed to the business. So when you put a business person in front of a system and say, okay, all your data is in there now, ask whatever question you like and along any axes, uh, and here's the, the, the extent of the model, and it's, it's comprehensive. It covers the entire domain of how you think about your, your job and your, your, your business. And just ask whatever you like. They've never seen that before. And they will drag IT in their wake. So, so, so there's a, been a, a shift in emphasis. We're now far better equipped uh, simply because the software has matured to the extent it's caught up with the traditional world. Don't forget we had to re-implement the entire stack, the entire chain, the databases, the middleware, the tooling, the user interfaces, all of that had to be brought up to work with those international standards. Uh, the results now are pretty obvious. Uh, and so when we load up, for, say, uh, in a competitive intelligence for farmer type demo, um, and we can bring in uh, you know, data from, I don't know, 50, 60 sources um, and co commingle that and now let, uh, put a user in front and they can answer a question that their IT people couldn't get them an answer to in a year. And they can do it in five minutes. It, it really is a way to get started because they say, I, you know, I don't care how you're doing this, uh, just we want some. And, and, you, and it's accelerating the, the take up of this technology. So sure, in the long run, IT will end up uh, create, we, do, we call it linking and contextualization. It's where you basically take your data sets, uh, you put them in a data lake. We call it a smart data lake. Uh, there's a process through which you um, you link and contextualize that data. You resolve the entities and so on. But you, you're essentially, instead of leaving the data in a warehouse where it's it's really only good for answering the questions you designed that warehouse to answer, instead you're using these standards to leave your data in a form 
where it's discoverable because everything's tagged as models behind shared models behind all the tags in the data. So you can discover that data, and you can an end user can just select data sets and commingle them. And because you've used the standards, there's no further integration required. So I think in the future, IT's job will become to effectively deliver data in a form where it's been linked and contextualized and become smart data so that it becomes basically random access by anyone who's, who's entitled to, to see that data and, and mix it with other similar data sets. And the standards pretty much enable all of that. Um, so uh, it, we're in a very exciting spot here at the moment, I think, because the reality of, of the semantic uh, vision, which has been playing out you know, for, what, 10, 15 years now, is finally being delivered in actual applications. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, excitement uh, amongst, uh, certainly amongst our customers, and I think hopefully we'll see this at the show in a couple of weeks, um, where people are now starting to see the promise finally um, of, of, of smart data being applied. Okay. Well, uh, you gave me a, a nice segue there to the next question uh, when you mentioned uh, data lakes. So, um, uh, Historically, if I can call it that, given how recent the history is, you know, the notion of a data lake is uh, basically a Hadoop-based repository of, of data, and it sort of accepts everything that, that flows into it. Um, uh, what's the relationship then between uh, smart data and big data? How does, how does smart data, um, I, I guess, make big data better? How does big data leverage smart data? Uh, however you choose to answer that question, Sean. So um, there's a number of ways. One of the issues with the data lake approach, and it's re I always think about the data lake as kind of the, the extreme reaction to the inflexibility and uh, control um, of the warehouse. So if you look at warehouse on one end of a spectrum and, and data lake at the at the other end, uh, there's a big danger that you could find yourself in a, in a data swamp where you've, you've lost control of your data. Sure, there's a lot of flexibility because the data is there and it's available, but it's just mountains of files in a file system, effectively. Um, so what, where semantics can help, and there's quite a few um, people talking about this, is, is, is providing a, a metadata backbone to describe all that information. So that's that's. Part A. I think you can use semantic models to describe the data. You, you don't just uh, IT doesn't just toss it over the wall into a file system, but but instead has to is responsible for tagging tagging that data. And, and semantic models are, are a very good way of doing that. Uh, the other thing is, that we'd recommend is that at least one of the ways you store those that data is is in in these open standards. Uh, it feature proofs it. You know, if the if the notion is we're going to collect everything because we never know what, when we're going to need it, then you really want to future proof it. And by using these open standards, you've you've identified the data and you've you've given it meaning so that whoever comes along later on can easily reuse it. Um, for us at Cambridge Semantics, we allow something called a smart data lake, which is really that whole metadata layer I've been describing. And, and then on top of that, ad hoc analytics on any combination of data sets you can find. So as a user, you can just come along, uh, select uh, um, data sets out of a catalog. Uh, these data sets have been pre-prepared, so they've been linked and contextualized. They've been tagged. They, they agree with, you know, they're part of a, they're aligned with a model that has meaning to the, to the end user, the business user, and then they can spin those up into memory, and that's where the big data approach comes. Not only have you got big data, a large amount of it stored in, say, HDFS, many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data sets and a catalog that describes them using that metadata, but now you can select a few of them, the ones that you need, and spin them up into memory, and you could be looking at a few billion triples uh, worth of data and be able to do ad hoc analytics. And all of that is really relatively a new capability. You know, just the last year or two has that become viable, um, where you, we're using in-memory uh, uh, graph analytics to be able to do interactive dashboarding and so on. So, so that's for us what, what uh, the, 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 where big data meets smart data, a smart data lake. Okay. Uh, good opportunity for me to remind uh, the audience that uh, if you have any questions, please submit them now so that we can make sure to answer them um, before the hour is up. Uh, Dave Dugal, um, how do you see the relationship to big data? Well, uh, this is a good question. Actually, we're working with one of the world's largest consulting firms on, on this problem you know, right now. And um, 
And I think you're really talking about two different sides of this spectrum, right? I think that, uh, you know, big, these big pools of data that's collected in sort of an arbitrary fashion on the um, possibility that you might want to use it or it might be relevant is, and that it might be very large sets and it might be streaming large sets that uh, provides a certain kind, kind of value. It's sort of a, a latent Right value, right? You're you're just collecting a lot of data because you can, right? Because uh, throughout this call, we've been talking about, you know, we've gone from a time of scarcity to a time of abundance, right? You know, network storage and processing is all much cheaper today and much more widely available. So you can you can collect something like a data lake, where uh, smart data adds values. It's it's like the small data. To me, I look at it as the set of uh, it's a model of a set of relationships that provides a, a set of facts that I could then use to trim a big data query. And I could do that in real time, right? Because, uh, you know, big data is a, a big unmodeled pool of, you know, of various kinds of information, of various kinds of type. And uh, what you want to do is instead of looking through the whole set, right, that's in, in, in graph processing, that's essentially a brute force when you trim a graph, right? So it's a brute force activity. But actually, if we're really talking about intelligence, what we really want is applications, right? We're talking about, talking about transactions, not just data and writing queries and doing analytics against pre-prepared uh, data, right? And that, remember that pre-prepared data is a schema unto itself. So, but I think what we're really talking about is actually having a higher level of abstraction, creating abstractions for applications that say, hey, I have an application, it has these concepts it's related to, um, and every time there's an interaction, it re re uh, sort of looks at that sea of relationships, it uses the sort of in-band metadata that describes that transaction, sort of bootstrap the navigation of a semantic traversal of objects inside the model, so that it could then interpret a, a set of big data, right, and very quickly get to the set of relevant information maybe in a big data set. So I would look at as smart data as abstract models that facilitate or bootstrap the trimming of, uh, of a big data set, right? Because, you know, you don't really ever need the whole set, right? You, you want the set. I mean, uh, you know, each one of us walks around with a sea of information, and if we couldn't filter it well, uh, our heads would explode, right? Our ability to act, act in a specific context and react to that intelligently is what sort of defines us as human beings. And so the same way in systems, we want applications that can look against abstract models, that can trim large sets of information to the relevant sets of information, and sort of work hand in hand with big data. So I think it is, it's almost a small data, big data, smart data, you know, it's all smart data collectively, and it's almost like these small models uh, against large sets and helping you trim those large sets to get answers that are relevant. Okay. Uh, well, before we take uh, an audience question, Dave McComb, I'll give you a chance to, to answer this question. And Dave, I think you're currently muted, so you'll need to take yourself off mute. Maybe not. Maybe that's, I uh, can't hear Dave right now. So why don't we uh, take this question. Um, the question is, uh, if one opens data to a wider set of queries with new flexibility, can hardly avoid introducing new errors and even new kinds of errors, perhaps much more subtle than previously. So what are the specific challenges in validating semantic data systems? Dave or Sean, Dave Dugal or Sean, get it? Tackle in. Well, that's that's a uh, a great question. Um, that's it's actually really it's it's really almost the question, right? Is uh, when you go into a more abstract environment where you're actually um, uh, explicitly allowing for more flexible relationships because you want that variety and you want that flexibility, um, then what, what you know can your system go out of control, as it were? And I think well, when compared to essentially static siloed applications where everything's done a priori, where everything is rigid and you know that there'll be no, well, I mean, of course, even rigid applications break too and you can have side effects and, uh, of, of uh, static applications as well, but you're, you're, you are uh, starting from a perspective that you want to lock everything down. Uh, I think the way you do it in a declarative application, or the way we do it in a declarative application, is that it's as, as flexible as appropriate, right? We use, we use the phrase as flexible as possible, as procedural as necessary, 
right? There are some uh, human interactions that say collaboration, right? Well, a collaboration is a kind of interaction where you'd like it to be more flexible and you might have less rules on it. Whereas a transaction for a specific uh, buying a ticket for something or anything, um, or you know logging anything into a, um, a store, is uh, maybe more structured, and you need things to be in a concrete and explicit way. And the way you so the way you back that into abstract models is through the constraints themselves. So you can actually put constraints on behaviors. You can say, well, yes, you're related to my object, but you can't just you have to use my object in a specific way uh, to actually record something against me, you have to give me these, this data in this, in this format and then I'll record it. If you don't, um, you're, not, you're not playing nicely with me and therefore the transaction won't go through. So the way you layer it back in is through policy and constraints. Um, and uh, again, I, I would, we're working in highly regulated domains, uh, life sciences to telecom. Um, and in those domains, um, what they're finding is they want the flexibility, and you're right, they want sort of those enterprise class or carrier grade uh, controls, because their business compliance does matter, um, their IT governance does matter, and you're right, that is tricky, um, and it's something that has to be addressed in, in, this, in, the, in the platform that you're looking at. Uh, we, we do it through policies and constraints as a way, but the, the advantage of using it through uh, constraining things through policies is that it's still declarative and that if you have the right permissions, you can modify the policy over t uh, time to reflect new requirements, whereas if you do it in embedded in code, um, then you get those sort of accidental complexity of the systems themselves become hard to change. So you want that ability to lock things down while still keeping them mutable because inevitably they will change. Okay. Looks like we had Dave McCone back. Are you there, Dave? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. The line dropped and no. I went mute. No problem. Um, um, so the question here is, what are the specific challenges in validating semantic data systems? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in that question. When the semantic web standards came along, there was the assumption that when you, when you go to web scale for your information systems, that at any given moment, your view of the world is incomplete. And there's, you know, they refer to this as the open world problem, et cetera. Um, but trying to square that with the enterprise, where in the enterprise, they believe that their set of data is complete. And, and how do you uh, almost sort of mix and match uh, a set of data that is inherently incomplete, uh, loosely structured, loosely formatted, stuff that that you can't curate because you're harvesting it from the outside world with sets of data that you've spent a huge amount of money making sure it's exactly right. And, and I would I'll agree with Dave DeGal there. I, I think the solution, what we're working with our clients now, is just how to recognize some of your repositories, some of your data sets are going to be highly curated. You, you are going to have constraints on the way in. You can really count on what's in there. And you're also going to be harvesting data from the, the wild web, if you will, or any other source, which is not going to be curated. It's going to be incomplete. And, and the key is you can have a schema over the top of all of that to say when you want to, you can combine the, the uh, less curated data with the, with the more curated data and get a more complete picture. Okay. So, uh, gents, we've got about three minutes left here. I'm going to ask each to make a 30 second or, or make a prediction in 30 seconds for the future of smart data. Um, Sean, can you do that in 30 seconds? I'm not hearing Sean, so Dave Dugal. <laughs> in five to ten years, you won't recognize enterprise IT. It will be um, things that we do today that are all manual, um, writing apps for being parallel, writing things for being data for being immutable, uh, writing things for asynchrony, um, manually integrating APIs. Uh, our children will look at us and say, Dad, you did what? Um, uh, you have to actually look at that, read it, and manually integrate it, when in the future that will all be semantic, dynamic, and fully governable. Yeah, it would be interesting to go back in the and, and uh, uh, imagine where we would be today. I think it's stunning. Sean, do we have you back? 
Yeah, yeah apologies. I, I was just going to say, watch smart data. We're going to see it explode over the next two or three years. Five years out, who knows? Ten years, it's impossible. But uh, two, three years, smart data will be everywhere, for sure. Okay. Dave McCone, what's your prediction? Boy, I hate to, I hate to be the naysayer on this one, but I, I suspect <laughs> that five years from now, 95% of the companies will be operating more or less as they currently are. Um, just we've done a lot of 10-year plans for people and watch the inertia is unbelievable however like I said earlier there is still hope there's the 5% um, 5 percent of the companies are going to embrace this and are going to have some some radical transformation and I do think you know most people uh, overestimate change in the short term and underestimate it in the long term I do think in the long term what 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 the enterprise information systems are going to look like is going to be a lot more like the app store. We won't have these big monolithic applications. We'll have little tiny pieces of functionality. But unlike the app store, which works because you are the systems integrator, the app store will be little tiny pieces of application that are already pre-integrated into the firm. And as soon as you pick it up and use it, you're off and running. So uh, the, the long term, very rosy, short term, for most folks, it's going to look a lot like it looks today. Yeah, I think that's always, that's that's the challenge is uh, picking the time frame. I think the direction is often is often is uh, you know whether it's twenty five or twenty years. Uh, that's that's the hard part. So uh, we're going to need to wrap things up here. Uh, if you'd like to meet all of all three of our panelists today, and in fact Shannon and myself as well, uh, please join us at the Smart Data Conference in San Jose in a couple of weeks. And we'll be giving away a couple of tickets to that conference after the session today. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who joined us, and uh, in particular our panelists. Um, good job, gentlemen. And uh, I'll hand you back now to our host, Shannon Kim. Shannon? Thanks, Tony. And thank you, everyone, uh, especially to our attendees for being engaged in everything that we do. I love the questions that have come in. One of the most popular questions, of course, is about the slides and the recording. Just a reminder, I will be sending out links to both by the end of day Thursday. So if you don't have that in your inbox by the time you walk in on Friday, just let me know and I will make sure and get you a copy. Uh, again, thanks to our panelists and, and to Tony for, for such a great discussion. This has been fantastic. And really appreciate you guys putting this together. And I will see you in San Jose in a couple of weeks. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.